It looks like we've got 16 attendees so far. So that's great. People will just be joining as we go. Um, so I just want to say hello and welcome folks to our first ever um, Marine Conservation Institute webinar. So series is not tr quite true yet, but we're planning for it to be a series. And so please bear with us on the technical side. Uh, we do want to note that though everybody's muted, the chat window is open. So you're welcome to chat uh, with other attendees or the panelists directly. And any real questions that you really want us to answer, there's a Q&A section. So you can chat in there, but we'll be pulling questions from the actual Q&A section. So please submit questions through that. And uh, I want to just say in advance, apologies for any additional noises outside of myself or Sam. Uh, I know my dogs are here and there's a thunderstorm going on outside, so I will do my best to keep them quiet, but I cannot control the weather and uh, their reactions. So apologies in advance for that. Uh, so the Marine Conservation Institute, for those of you who don't know us already, uh, is a nonprofit. We're, we're based around the West Coast for the most part. We have offices in Northern California in the Bay Area and in the Seattle area. I'm personally actually based out on the East Coast in Massachusetts. And we were uh, founded originally by Dr. Elliot Norse, and we focus primarily on marine protected areas throughout the world. So we have what we call the Marine Protection Atlas or the MP Atlas, which is a global map of marine protected areas throughout the world. And we have a program called the Blue Parks Program, where we reward well-managed and well-placed marine protection around the world. So we really want to uh, elevate great marine protection around the world through our work. And my name is Beth Pike. I'm a conservation scientist. I work primarily on the Atlas Project. And today what we wanted to do is give our folks that follow us on social media and who support us, an opportunity to get to know us. Given that nobody can go anywhere these days, we thought this would be a fun way for you to get to know who we are. So Sam is going to be our first victim today. And Sam is going to tell you a little bit more about his background. Uh, but he joined us a few years back. His focus is on seamounts and deep sea uh, biology and so I wanted to we thought it'd be really neat to share with you guys a little bit of kind of our other lives uh, and some of the research that we've done some of the experiences we've had and Sam's been on a number of cruises out to look at deep sea ecosystems so we want to share that with you so we hope you find the topic fun we'll have lots of pictures if you can't see the slideshow which is up right now please chat let us know that you're having any trouble but you should be seeing uh, the intro slide uh, with the ray on the on the front and so this isn't going to be and we didn't want for it to be a formal presentation uh, sam and i both have discussed some topics we want to chat about but we don't have a scripted presentation for you today so we're hoping for this to be a less formal kind of conversational type webinar. So please feel free to jump in with Q&A. Uh, and we will also have a section at the end specifically to go through questions and answers. So if you don't get a question answered during the conversation, we will spend time at the end going back and getting those questions. So I want to thank you again for joining us. And I'm going to give Sam an opportunity to introduce himself. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here and for your past and continued support. Like Beth said, my name is Samuel Georgian. I am a staff scientist here at Marine Conservation Institute. I came here about four years ago from graduate school at Temple University, where I focused on um, studying quite a few different aspects of deep sea ecosystems, ranging from climate change to some predictive habitat modeling. And I've done quite a bit of extensive field research uh, in the deep sea, but I actually wanted to start by just, see if I can get my slides going here, started with one of my actual first field expeditions, which was fresh out of college, where I worked on these tiny seabird colonies off the coast of Maine. And you might not think, but 
deep sea research and seabird research surprisingly similar, not that the organisms are that similar, um, but that the environment you are in um, felt very similar to me. So when I was in Maine working on these seabird colonies, we would live on these small islands for a period of weeks up to months, um, which was very similar feeling to working on kind of a larger research ship. I mean, some of the islands were probably about as small as some of the <laughs> ships that I've been on. So it's a very similar feeling of working with a small group of people for long periods of time, going through some hardships like running out of fresh food um, and staring at the same scenery every day. Um, but like deep sea research, I found the work in Maine to be very rewarding. Um, you're in a very scenic, beautiful place that a lot of people don't really get to experience in the way that you do when you're doing field research. Where in Maine were you? Uh, just quite a few um some, like really small islands um off the coast of like bremen um so oh. this is part of audubon's um project to reintroduce puffins and then this is actually a turn that we worked with as well um yeah, so this is kind of, simply not a puffin yeah not a puffin. <laughs> one of my first forays into to really jumping into field research where, where you're out for weeks at a time and you're not just going home every day and then I uh, went to grad school and started doing deep sea research. So you're on these fairly large oceanographic vessels um, for days or weeks at a time. And again, you're kind of with a small group of people. So you better hope that you like who you are sailing at sea with. So here I am just doing some work on one of the vehicles that we use for, for deep sea exploration. Here I am looking uh, at some of the screens that we use in the remotely operated vehicle control van. So this is a remotely operated vehicle. It's a survey vehicle that we send down into the water, but it stays connected to the ship by a really long tether. And then all the scientists and the ROV pilots will sit in this really small, really cold van on the ship. And you pilot the ROV and you look at what's coming in and the scientists sit in the van and kind of help direct the survey and tell the pilots where we want to go, what we want to collect. And this is what I do like most of the time. So I <laughs> wanted to put this in because, uh, you know, deep sea research and I think any kind of field research sounds really romantic to a lot of people and it is, but a lot of our time is actually spent just behind a computer screen, right? And I think that's true for most scientists. So this, actually was out at sea off the coast of California. And it was a situation where we were planning the next dive with the remotely operated vehicle. And some of the other scientists came up to me and said, well, hey, we want to dive on this part of the reef. We've never been there before. Can you build one of your models that will help us predict where we might find the most coral so we make the best use of our survey time? You look like you're excited in this picture, just for the record. Well, this was so a, while you were showing it as a boring part of your job, you look excited. This was a pose for the camera moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly am excited uh, by quite a bit of my modeling work. So, <laughs> and this is so this is one of the this was actually the first deep sea uh, expedition that I went on was aboard the Ronald Brown. It's um. I was going to say kind of a typical ship. It's actually like kind of one of the larger, nicer ships I've been out on. So I think this is about a 300 foot, 3000 ton um, ship. So it's large. I mean, there are entire rooms inside where you would never think that you were on a ship. And actually for myself, and you know, one of the questions I get a lot is like, oh, do you get seasick out there? And it's like, well, on smaller boats, no out on the deck no but there's something about being in a big room in the middle of a ship where your brain is like i don't think i'm on a ship but the room is moving and it doesn't like that yeah the disconnect you're I'm like i'm feeling out of balance but everything else is moving with you so it confuses everything yeah so ships are you know these these oceanographic ships have quite a large complement of sensors which helps us do our work so one of the most commonly ones that we use is the multi-beam sensor. So this is mounted usually near the front of the ship and it sends down 
um, a number of sound waves and those waves reflect off the ocean floor and the ship computer will time how long it takes for the sound waves to go down and back and that tells us how deep it is so you get a really accurate map um, of the area that you are multi-beaming a lot of times we will use that in conjunction um, to plan our survey so we might do the multi-beaming at night and then take a look i might run a model based on that data and say hey i think we're going to find corals over here so that's where we want to dive right because we don't want to well there's plenty of scientists who study mud but if you're looking for corals <laughs> you want to plan your dive so that you're not looking at mud the whole time and the multi-beam doesn't isn't very broad either you kind of have to go back and forth to get a real look. It mostly looks below you and then slightly off to the sides. Is that true? Or they, they, yeah, they you, can, you can adjust the beam width and it's usually a function of depth. Um, so you might have to, um, you know, in deeper waters, you'd have a different beam depth to get kind of the same accuracy of data that you're getting. But yeah, I mean, for the you know, I'm trying to remember what like a ship like the Ron Brown would normally do, but you're usually maybe doing a swath that's something like a few hundred meters wide. Um, yeah. And then, you know, there's, there's a variety of systems that, that just have different ways of, of handling that. One of the coolest kind of recent ways that they're using that data, um, so the sound wave goes down, it's eventually going to hit the bottom, but it also hit like fish that are in the water column, right? And until recently, we just kind of discarded all of that water column data until some really smart people came along and said, hang on, I think we can actually look at what fish are in the water column just based on data that we're already collecting. So that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing with these ships is that you have a lot of support for the vehicles that we actually put in the water to do the exploration. So you see this big, um, tan structure on the back of the ship that's called an A-frame and it's a pretty typical way to launch uh, remotely operated vehicles um, or other kind of vehicles in, in the water to do the surveys. And the last thing I would point out on the ship is just this giant satellite dish on top and that's also it's kind of a new technology that's taken over and it's called telepresence so it's you can be participating in a cruise in the middle of the Pacific Ocean from your house in Seattle. And that you're on like a six second delay, but you're getting the same video feed from the bottom of the seafloor. And you can hear the scientists talking. So I'll show you a video later of like, kind of what that sounds like on the ship and hearing the scientists. And it's, it's a really great tool for public outreach. So um, I'm sure we could share some links with the, the folks here. Um, some of the ships that do this, you can follow their expeditions and watch watch these surveys in real time. It's spectacular. And then scientists on board can kind of jump in and help out, right? So if we see an octopus and we don't have an octopus expert on board, well, someone sitting at home probably is and can help out. So it's really cool. Yeah, don't they usually have land-based scientists watching it to call in? I've, I've heard them talking before as they ran through them and they'd sometimes report in like, oh, so-and-so watching from, you know, Germany is saying this is this species. So yep. that's interesting too, because you don't have to physically be on the boat. Right. And it's kind of fun being on different watches. So on the ship, you might have, uh, you usually would work like two, four hour shifts during surveys. Um, but your, your shift might be like midnight to 4 a.m. And you right. just adjust your sleep schedule. So it's kind of interesting because you often get the same scientists jumping on. So I, my last cruise I was on, uh, we would always excitedly wait for like the Russian kind of scientists <laughs> to come on because they just happened to like be the expert at some of the stuff that we were looking at. So it was like really great to have them on. And you just the middle get, of the night for you was like their afternoon. So they were just sitting around watching right. what you did. <laughs> so you're kind of like, oh, I don't know what that is, but I think Russian, Russia will be online soon. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's, a really, it's a really powerful tool. So this is just me collecting some water. Um, in grad school, I did quite a bit of water chemistry work, looking at how our oceans are going to change with climate change. This is one of the, just like the funny quirks of being on a ship, right? So one of the first things they make you do is 
um, run through drill. So you learn where to go if there's a fire or if you are gonna have to abandon the ship. And then these are survival suits that I guess theoretically would, would help you avoid hypothermia if you fell overboard or had to abandon ship. And uh, there's really no graceful way to get in or out. <laughs> <laughs> especially if there's an air pocket in the feet <laughs> it flips you right over <laughs> yeah, well, especially if you get the wrong size <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is most people yeah I mean that's the thing too about being on a boat even though you're out there as a scientist or whatever you guys are you probably had emergency duties as well because in an emergency the people on board the boat are the doctors the fire department you know, everything that happens on the boat has to have a self-contained response, essentially. So yeah, you don't get a free ride usually on a boat. You usually have a job. Yeah, and this may surprise a lot of people if you haven't done this kind of research, but one of the biggest things we actually worry about on ships is fire. Yeah. Um, so it's not really, you're not expecting to really sink. It's If you have a fire, it can be very hard to contain and get deadly very quickly. So we do a lot of drills around, around that. This is a view of one of the control vans I was talking about where the scientists and the people actually piloting the survey vehicles will sit. So it's called the control van, but it's on the boat. Called it, yeah, because it's controlling the vehicle. So the, mm. you know, all the controls from the, the remotely operated vehicle come through that tether, that cable that goes back to the ship into this van. And then there's just, an insane amount of monitors and different instruments and it's a little hectic. Most control vans I've been on fit between like five and 10 people, um, which actually fills up pretty quickly because you have a lot of scientists who are very excited about what's going on and kind of want to be involved. So you end up with like all the seats are filled, but then you have people kind of crowding behind you. But it's usually, usually a pretty fun experience in there. That's what used to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you're just looking at mud, it's not as exciting. And then, then the control van is empty. <laughs> we don't get to crowd anymore. Um, I threw this in just as a, you know, I think people often see photos of research that looks very like clean and like these fancy aquariums and like, well, like I did most of my experiments in, in grad school in buckets. <laughs> so these are, you know, corals that we brought up from about 1500 feet below the surface of the ocean. And we stick them in buckets and we altered the water chemistry and saw how they were reacting. That's cool. I spent quite a lot of time in, this is called a cold room because we kept it cold enough to kind of support the temperature that the corals like. And this is one of the remotely operated vehicles, Hercules being deployed in the water. And you can see that tether coming off the back where all the communications come through. All right, so submersible. So we talked about remotely operated vehicles. So this is a human operated vehicle or an HOV or often just called a submersible. So this is Alvin. It's Woodhull's kind of premier submersible. They just did a major update on it. Is that the same one that it's always been? Uh, technically, no. I think it's like technically this is well, this might be an old photo, but technically what they use now is I think like Elvin too, but hmm. people still call it Elvin. And some of the components are the same, but they did, yeah, so three years ago or so, they did a major overhaul and put in a new titanium sphere. Um, and I, really it's, it's largely a new vehicle, I think, maybe with some parts coupled over. So this is just a short clip of that getting launched. Um, it's it's kind of an interesting way to launch a vehicle. So you see that there's actually a couple of people on top. So the pilot and the scientist will go up those those stairs on the left. So they get in on the ship, and then you have these uh, well, they're not really divers, but I guess just swimmers on top. And when the vehicle's in the water, they close the hatch really tight, do some safety checks, and then they get picked up by that small boat that you can see out there. Um, and this is one of the limiting factors for actually deploying this vehicle in rough seas is making sure that it's a safe environment for those guys. Yeah, looks like you could easily lose control of that thing if it was too rough. 
Yeah, and I say having been in this, um, a lot of people don't get seasick until you're back on the surface and bobbing around and then getting hoisted back up to the ship. <laughs> Right when you think like you're almost back on the ship. Um, but yeah, I mean, being down in Elvin was kind of one of the, I, I think for a lot of people, it's one of the kind of premier experiences of doing this kind of research. You study these, these ecosystems that are hundreds and thousands of feet below the surface for years. You look at lots of video and pictures and do experiments, but actually getting to go down and be in the ecosystem was an incredible experience. How deep does that go? Elvin, let's see. So I think the sphere, the new sphere is rated to 6,000 meters. And last I had checked, I know some of the cameras and stuff hadn't been upgraded yet. So it was still limited to like 4,000 meters. But I mean, 6,000 6, meters gets you a huge percentage of the ocean. Um, yeah. There's not that much that's actually deeper than that. So you can explore almost anywhere. Um, so and eight, obviously about you know, 18,000 feet for those who can't do yeah. math. <laughs> 18 to 20,000 feet, which is yeah. significant. Yeah, so I mean, and the further down you go, you know, the more of the dive you spend descending and ascending. Um, mm -hmm. You typically descend fairly slowly and then at the bottom, the vehicle is weighted at all times. So it's always positively buoyant, but then they add weights. And the reason for that is if there's an emergency, you can just drop the weights and you're not reliant on the vehicle's power to get back to the surface. It'll come back on its own. That makes sense. Yeah, so it does, you pop up pretty quickly. Um, and if they do an emergency ascent where they like just drop all the weights, which I, I should, I think maybe it's only happened like once, once or twice. Um, I've heard you come up like real fast um, and it's a pretty harrowing experience. <laughs> when I did whale research, the babies are positively buoyant. So they kind of dock under their mom's peck fins, but when they come out, they just shoot to the yep. surface. And that's what I'm picturing. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> This is a photo of me going into Alvin for the first time and um, someone had made me a cape out of a garbage bag. So I was proudly wearing that. And then I, I go to climb in and the pilot pops out and just starts yelling at me because you can't wear clothing. Just like on a ship, one of the things you really worry about in the, in the submersible is fire. Because mm -hmm. you're in a small closed environment that you're pumping right. oxygen into, right? So you can't wear clothing um, that can melt essentially. And so I had to go back and change. So Plus, and it, uh, and the fire it, has the disadvantage of using up oxygen quickly too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, they have oxygen for about three days, um, I think. And the uh, limiting factor is actually how much CO2 they can take out. So if you somehow got stuck down there, you have about three days for someone to come rescue you or else the CO2 level gets too high. They yeah, you just, you run out of whatever reactant they use in the, in the CO2, fil CO2 filter. And there is a complete backup filter, but you know, eventually everything runs out. So right. they give you, um, it's kind of funny when you go down, they give you the choice or they used to of either a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a ham <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> and I've gotten one of each, but I was always too busy to remember to eat it. So I can't remember, <laughs> or I can't tell you if it's good or not. Um, and then you have like a coconut energy bar. That's like the maximum calories that, you know, you can pack into a small thing in case there's an emergency. Um, and then you have a pee bottle. <laughs> You're down for like, Usually they try to be down for as long as they can to kind of maximize your efficiency. So it's usually about an eight hour dive and that's limited pretty much by Elman's batteries. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an option if you can't. That's all you get, a sandwich, a bar, some liquid, <laughs> and something to get rid of the liquid. <laughs> yeah. And there's no, there's no heater in Elman, right? Or, there might be, it doesn't really heat very much if there is. Um, 
So you, you kind of bring clothing to bundle up um, as long as it's not a garbage bag. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, I mean, it's a really incredible experience. There's some, I'm sure there's some great videos out there that you can, can watch about what it's like to go down in Elvin. That's a great picture. And then this is one of the other tools that we use for these surveys. It's an autonomous vehicle, AUV. And so this is a really great vehicle to use in conjunction with other vehicles, especially. So this is it doesn't have the sampling capability that one of the other two vehicles that I just talked about have, but it has um, the capability to hold quite a few sensors. And then it, the, the really cool thing is that it can cover a really large area of ocean compared to a submersible without human input. So this is like you, one of the techs will set this up the day before. Um, often we will run the, the autonomous vehicles at night and then we have all of that data to kind of inform the next day's dive with Alvin or, or an ROV. So it's a really um, rapidly increasing area of, of technology. And the tech is getting really good. We were talking about the drink bottles and Rob on the chat, Rob Moyer goes, yeah, Gatorade or Mountain Dew bottles are best because the color's a good match. <laughs> Sounds dangerous. <laughs> you definitely don't want to confuse the two. So that's cool. So there's three. So most of the time you'd carry all three of these. You'd have an ROV, an no. autonomous. No, so it depends on the cruise. Um, plenty of cruises will just have one vehicle. Um, there's also, there's other sampling equipment that I'm not going to go into here where it's um, like a towed camera that you just pull behind the ship um, or other sampling um, types of equipment that you have on the ship. But pretty common to go out with like one vehicle and then if you're lucky you would get like maybe like an ROV and an AUV at the same time or Elvin and an AUV. Mm -hmm. Yeah um, it seems like they complement each other. Yeah they complement each other very well. You typically don't want to run two vehicles at the same time um, for you know obvious collision reasons um, especially <laughs> You really, with the ROVs, you know, it has that long tether going down into the water column. So there's a lot of care taken to make sure that that's not hitting like the ship propeller or anything else that's in the water that it could get tangled on. Yeah, you don't want to foul that thing. No, been there. It's not a good experience. I foul less important things than the lifeline to a ROV. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, some of these vehicles cost you know, several, several million dollars and the yeah. submersibles way, I'm sure way more than that. So it's a, yeah, it's an expensive area of research. I think a lot of these deep sea cruises cost something on the order of like $50,000 per day. Jeez. Um, and how deep actually, did you go? I'm and sorry? How, how deep did you actually go? In Elvin? Mm -hmm. I went to about 1500 feet. What's the deepest you've gone? Was that your deepest? That was, yeah, all my dives were pretty close to that. Um, Cause I was studying one species of coral that pretty much grows at that depth. Um, yeah, I think on cruises I've been on, I mean with ROVs we've gone maybe up five, 6,000 feet, even more, can't quite remember. All right, let's get to the critters. Critters. All right, so these are my personal favorite deep sea corals. <laughs> so a lot of people aren't maybe aware of this. You know, when you picture a coral reef, you're thinking tropical, you know, Hawaii coral reef, but actually most species of corals grow in the deep sea. And so these are pretty different biologically. So shallow water corals have algae that live inside of them, and they kind of have a symbiotic relationship where the algae are growing using sunlight and then transferring some of that energy to the coral to grow. So shallow water corals grow very rapidly. Deep sea corals grow well below the photic zone. So there's almost no light or no light down here. So they're not able to get any energy from the sun. So these guys are entirely reliant on marine snow, which is live and dead plankton and other 
um, nutrients falling from the surface. And so these are um, suspension feeders that are, they have small, oh, perfect timing, polyps that you can <laughs> see here with these little tentacles that are just grabbing food out of the water column. And they typically grow very, very slowly. Um, and one kind of side effect of that, thinking from a conservation point of view, is that when you damage one of these communities, they don't rebound the same way that like a tropical reef has the potential to do. A lot of these communities, I mean, some of these individual corals, I can show you some more as I talk. Um, like this is a black coral, despite appearances. <laughs> um, it's, you can maybe kind of see that the actual skeleton is black. Um, but they come in an astonishing oh, you on the left you can see the dark actual skeleton on it yeah um black corals can be like hundreds thousands of years old um so i've i've been on a cruise off the coast of israel where we collected they had just recently discovered that there was a black coral reef off the coast of israel and we were exploring it and we thought one of the corals I think might have been like 6,000 years old, if I remember correctly. Um, just kind of astonishing. And they grow very, very slowly. This is kind of widely, I think, people like think of as the most beautiful coral. It's Eritogorgia. It grows in this really cool spiral um, that probably just kind of gives it the structure to get up into the water column. So corals and other suspension feeders because they're grabbing these little food particles as current flows past them, they kind of like to get off the bottom because on the bottom, the current is usually a little bit um, weaker and you get a little bit more sediment and that kind of interferes with their ability to feed. So a lot of these corals, like their whole strategy is like get up into the water column. So they grow on rocks, they grow on shells um, and they have these really cool structures that help them get tall and maximize surface area. Before you go away from this, um, there's two green dots. So for people who don't know what that's doing, you might want to explain why the two green dots on the picture, because you'll see it in a lot of these actually, I think. Yeah, so if you, it's, they're kind of shown right now. And yeah. this is actually a measuring tool. So if you think about coming back from your cruise and being like, oh, that was a cool coral. Like, I wonder how tall it was. Well, it's really hard from video to determine how tall this was without a frame of reference. So you have these lasers that shine out from the vehicle and they will be a set distance apart. These, if I remember, were maybe like 10 centimeters apart. And so it just gives you that frame of reference to, to do the calculation later. And this coral, uh, if I remember, was like a few meters or about as tall as a person. Yeah, it looks pretty tall, but you know, don't have anything to compare it to, so. Right, I mean, that's the problem. And a lot of, so with some of my Gulf of Mexico work, looking at the uh, response of these deep sea corals to the oil spill that happened in 2010, um, you might be going back to like the exact same coral colony every year and assessing like how much tissue did it lose as a result of the oil exposure, and then is it also recovering? So having some kind of frame of reference really helps with that kind of study. Were they also looking at the um, dispersants they used to in their impact? Because in a lot of cases, wasn't that actually worse than the oil itself? Yeah, so one of my uh, colleagues in graduate school, um, Danielle DeLeo, was kind of studying the how toxic oil and dispersants were Your to some of stopped, by the, way. the corals um in the gulf of mexico and yeah yeah i think in a lot of you know she had quite a body of work with that research but i think a lot of it did kind of turn out that the dispersant was yeah just as or more toxic than the oil itself um and partly that's you know different communities they're kind of used to breaking down oil right like there's a lot of oil naturally occurring in the gulf of mexico right and that's something they've seen yeah. microbes on the beaches and even in the deep sea that are capable of breaking down oil um, it's when you go in and do these cleanups so I think even with the Exxon Valdez spill they're finding you know three decades later that it was the rocks that they like really scrubbed the oil off that haven't recovered because mm -hmm. you've just totally wiped out that that mi microbial community 
Um, so yeah, similar things in the golf. We maybe acted a little, a little rashly um, with some of our cleanup efforts. And then as a coral biologist, I always forget about sponges, but sponges are <laughs> they're cool too. Even, you know, a lot of the same conditions that you find corals growing. Um, in some cases like this, you, you come across what we kind of call a sponge reef where it's, you know, there oh, are corals there. That looks sponges. like a storybook. Yeah, so I think those are called trumpet sponges and they're just, you know, whatever conditions they like to grow in must just be perfect there because they're just, there's just fields of them. That. that is awesome. Yeah, and one thing that you, corals as well, but you can see with the sponges here is that even the dead skeletons provide a really important habitat. So you have a ton of organisms that rely on corals and sponges as habitat because otherwise in the deep sea, a lot of the times it's just kind of flat mud or barren rocks. It's not a great environment, but then you get these corals growing or these sponges growing. And even when they die, they leave skeletons that are really important um, and serve as the foundation for these ecosystems. That's awesome. Looks like a Dr. Seuss book. Yeah. All right. Uh, here we go. All right. So this is uh, a video of an octopus from the American Samoa cruise that I went on with the Nautilus this past year. And I will say, um, scientists, we all have like our specialties and we all like to pretend like, oh, I only really care about corals or microbe guys. Like, yeah, I just want to see sediment. But when <laughs> we find an octopus, <laughs> Everyone gets excited, and even if we're on a really busy survey and we have a lot to do, you're often find that we like follow the octopus for like ten minutes. Because <laughs> everybody, time. the octopus guy is like, "Get off my animal!" <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna let the audio play here. This is the audio from the control van on the Nautilus. So you're hearing myself and the other scientists and the pilots in the control van just kind of talk about um, the octopus and. Really, we're mostly just geeking out about how cool it is. Wow. Huge. Oh my gosh. Which variety is this? They're in a tendril. Is it a dumbo? No. Yeah. Yeah, it's a dumbo. Is it? It was not. I mean, it has the flapping ears. It oh looks like it has much longer. Yeah, it looks so longer. The head morphology looks really different. Go a little wider. Nice. It looks very stretched out, like very long. Wow. It is huge. Like, <laughs> how big is that? Like, it's like more than 20 centimeters across. Because the lasers were like. Yeah, we had them on there. We could see later, but I don't want to ruin the shot now. <laughs> that is a big animal. Well, I was asking for an octopus. Yeah. You How big was it? Just one for this watch. It's pretty good. Oh my gosh. Wow. It's really putting on a show for us. Yeah, he seems a little. That's fantastic. I wonder if we could see the other end. Oh my gosh. Yeah, can you go to the left? Yeah, come around, please. <laughs> you can do you think it's doing this for like kind of a little wider video? Making, his, making us think he's so big and then he's threatening towards just us. Just gently back off a bit. Yeah. He wants us to know that he's too big to slurp. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that was one of like my the my favorite animal encounters with all of my field work. Just just gorgeous, and we followed it for like I don't know, ten or fifteen minutes, and kind of billowed for a while, and then we left it alone. So was that what it was doing, rounding itself out? That was part of a like a display, not how it moves. That's a great hypothesis. We don't know, right? So. Um, and this goes back to why the telepresence is so helpful. So in the control van, when we found this guy, there was myself, who's a, more of a coral biologist. Um, I think there were two geologists and then the ROV pilots. So it's not like we, whatever we encounter, we don't necessarily have 
that type of expert on the ship. So we were speculating that it was a type of octopus called a Dumbo octopus because the ears that you can see look, look like Dumbo, right? The Disney elephant. Um, and then it turns out, so we had an octopus expert weigh in just kind of a little bit later. And it's a serotoothed octopus, which is a family of octopuses that's related, but separate from Dumbo. And they actually, last I checked, the latest thinking was that this is likely a new species. So it doesn't have a name yet? Doesn't, well, I, if it's a new species, no. And it's kind of one of those, like, you wonder how many cruises before telepresence, they found a new species of octopus. And everyone was like, oh, it's probably just this other thing that we borrowed. Right. Seen. Yeah. That's awesome. That was, everybody loves this um, video. This is lighten up the Q&A section. We should have just started with the octopus, yeah. I think. But um, they wanted to know um, about the lights shining on there and whether it bothers the animals. Yeah, so I would say it really depends on what type of animal, um, but some fish and sharks especially seem to be really curious about the vehicles in my experience and they kind of come check it out. Um, definitely quite a few like fish and octopuses uh, have what I would is essentially a fear response and try to probably just think we're a giant predator that they haven't seen before. Um, I know there's there's been a little bit of research into whether the lights can be like too bright for some animals, but I don't, you know, it's a, that's a hard thing to study. Um, Do you usually try to like only have the light on for certain periods of time to be, like you wouldn't want to chase this thing around extensively? Just yeah, so we usually, we definitely leave, leave things alone after we've kind of gotten a good look at it. Um, and I would, you know, Really, we don't chase things around too much. Um, um, yeah, some, you know, and a lot of fish, especially, they're, they're run away, but they go like five feet away and then they hide on the bottom and they're like, fuck <laughs> me. <laughs> so does this thing have eyes? Like, things, yeah, probably view us as like maybe a predator that they're not familiar with, but otherwise don't seem to be too affected. Does it have eyes? Like, or because it must because it knows there's a light on it or some way to sensing light yeah i think if you watch this this whole video which um madeline maybe you can post that if you just search like zero toothed octopus nautilus you can post a link to the full video i think you can you can see that later okay yeah, this, well, wasn't even like, post that. this wasn't even like what i thought was going to be the cool video like we're going to start <laughs> like the next two are really truly bizarre creatures so this is the rov so that one was unmanned so you that guys was, were up at the surface yeah. okay yep. all right so this is a giant isopod and i started this isn't like a great photo of it i'm going to show you a video but i wanted to start with this photo so you get a sense of how big these are so they're kind of the same size as like a football and they can grow, I think the largest on record is like 20 inches long, um, which is really massive. So these are crustaceans. They're pretty closely related to um, potato bugs, or you might have called them roly polies. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on like where you grew up in the States. Um, so you might find these, these little guys in your garden, and it's actually related to this. Wow. Here's a video of one from the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> swimming around oh nice landing really cool creatures they dig these burrows that you can kind of see everywhere when you get into like isopod territory um, they mostly i believe are scavengers although there's quite a few videos of them predating on fish and small sharks what they eat sharks yeah, there's a really cool video of um, there was like a, bait, a baited trap, and there was a bunch of um, I think dogfish around, and yeah. like you kind of I think you normally when you see a video with a shark, you think the shark is really big, and they're actually were like really small sharks, but then this isopod just comes out of nowhere and like starts fighting a shark, just incredible. So these so are like just pick out whatever's down there that they can are they like scavengers like a lobster would do. 
they I think the kind of primal mode for their feeding is to scavenge so that you see them all the time at like whale falls which is when a whale dies and the carcass ends right. up on the bottom and it supports this whole new community um you see them on like squid and larger fish carcasses a lot um and they kind of like so one cool thing about about isopods is that they're a really nice example of deep sea gigantism so where things just get really big in the deep sea compared to what they're related to right. and one reason for that is because if you're bigger you can have a big meal and then live for a long time without any food so like a hummingbird has to eat like pretty i think like every hour or they're in trouble isopods the giant isopods they think can go like five years without food and then when they find like the next big meal they just gorge themselves yeah that's awesome all right next crazy critter all right who's scared of spiders <laughs> well, i am <laughs> uh this is a sea spider we see these not too commonly, although I think they're probably pretty easy to miss too if you're not looking for it. Um, so they aren't true spiders. They're kind of equally related to spiders and scorpions and horseshoe crabs. Um, and they fill kind of an interesting niche in the ecosystem or role in the ecosystem that these are actually predating on a lot of the soft bodied invertebrates like corals and sponges and anemones and worms. So we see them a lot of the times on corals and they kind of just go from polyp to polyp and they have a long feeding tube that they will just jam in and kind of suck out, you know, nutrients. Um, so they're one of the kind of relatively few things that actually is feeding on the corals down here. Is that what it's doing? This one, so this one actually, I believe has eggs. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know exactly what it's doing. It's also cool. It's one of the few species in the world where the male uh, is the one that's responsible for eggs and in some species looking after the young. Cool. That's awesome. I don't mind these when I'm like on the ship and it's thousands of feet yeah. away. <laughs> and we're going to leave it safely there. Won't be at my house. Yeah. <laughs> And that's the footage I have. How are we doing on time? Yeah, we're at, we have like 10 minutes left. So we probably want to kind should of wrap skip, up this part I and try and get a few questions in. Okay, so the last thing I was going to touch on was kind of like how I became a marine biologist. So if people have questions about that, kind of feel free to ask. And I think otherwise we will switch to answering questions. Sure. Um, let's bring up the last slide, though, too. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about one of our, kind of my current research projects and our advocacy projects, which is protecting the California seamounts. So if you didn't realize, there's about 60 seamounts off the coast of California, and they are just incredible places. Check out our website. We have some photos and videos of them. They support a lot of the corals and sponges and these ecosystems that I've been showing you. Um, and so we've been kind of building the scientific case to protect these ecosystems from fishing and climate change and a lot of human, human threats. Um, so you all can become a sea mountaineer. We have a pledge that you can take, which I think we're going to share the link to. Um, so take a look at that, um, become a sea mountaineer. I think we have a, um, uh, patch that we are able to send people with a donation um, that looks like like this image on the right so it's a really it's a really cool way to kind of get involved with some of our work protecting the california seamounts yeah, yeah specifically a 20 dollar donation gets you the patch and the patch looks just like this picture and then i think we better start answering some questions here if we're gonna <laughs> Yeah. All right. So Madeline has been um, collecting your questions from the chat windows and everything and is going to start um, sending them in. So if you had a question in the middle, you can also jump on the Q&A and, and throw them in there. But we're going to start pulling questions off uh, the Q&A. And a couple of these we actually already answered because we answered the species of the octopus, which was a super exciting we don't know. 
and the Nautilus Explorer was a remote controlled. Uh, Angela wanted to know if you can turn off the lights and see bioluminescence. Is there bioluminescence at that depth? There are certainly quite a few things that bioluminesce. So the um, one of the most commonly known one is some of the angler fish, which um, have like oh, yeah. that projection that they a use. A little lantern. Or fish. So yeah, there there can be a lot of light down there. Um, we do occasionally turn the lights off and just get a sense of of what it would look like. I haven't personally really seen too much, but. Um, and then Burgess asked if we can add elaborate elaborate on the types of advocacy being done in connection with the Sea Mountain Air Initiative. So your so your support goes towards what? Yeah, so I would say it's kind of like maybe three fronts. So one is doing kind of the scientific research to build an evidence-based case that these are important ecosystems, that they deserve protection, and kind of looking at what threats they're under. Um, then we have an outreach, so things like this webinar, our social media, um, putting out content to build public support for protecting these seamounts. And then we have a policy office in DC um, through which we will kind of advocate for legislating protection for these areas. Perfect. And then there's one other question that I had seen in the chat, but the window kind of goes by and I was trying not to be distracted by the chat window. But someone, Natasha asked if you can talk about the pharmaceuticals uh, from deep sea coral sponge communities. It's best, I know it's not your specialty, but um, that yeah, was so I would say that's like a very open field that we've studied a bit. But one of the reasons that you want to protect some of these places is, yeah, some of these corals could have like a cure for cancer. And if we go through and destroy them now, we might never realize that. Um, so yeah, I think something like crazy, like half of our medicinal uh, pharmaceutical drugs like are derived from some kind of naturally occurring compound, like aspirin, right, is pretty much like a chemical found in willow bark. Um, and there's just thousands and thousands of examples like that. Like nature is still a little bit ahead of us for some of these pharmaceuticals. Um, there's been a few findings that were um, from deep sea organisms. So I know there's like a sponge that has a chemical and I don't, I forget what pharmaceutical or what disorder it, it helps cure. Um, but there's been a, a few, there's also a few chemicals that are very useful for scientific research that were originally derived from deep sea microbes. Right, and the so, other thing we can get from the sea, somebody else asked, so this kind of segues perfectly into that, are um, minerals. And that's obviously a huge uh, thing right now with protecting these mineral extraction, uh, which could soon go commercial, you know, in these places where we would essentially be looking for things to put in our cell phones and our computers and. and yeah, and unfortunately, the areas that have those minerals tend to coincide with areas of high biodiversity. And the way that those minerals would be extracted would be just wholesale destruction of any community that's there. Yeah, so yeah. that's one thing that isn't really happening right now off the coast of California, um, isn't really happening anywhere yet, but we're kind of on the cusp. There's quite a few companies that have invested a lot of money into gearing up towards doing that at a large scale. Well, yeah, and as you mentioned before too, these communities of deep sea corals that our risk in that effort are take thousands of years to grow, which is mind boggling, uh, similar to an old growth forest. You know, if you lose the, the structure, the coral, or in the case of an old growth forest, the trees, they don't grow back in thousands of years and the ecosystem they support is gone for at least that long. And a thousand years is a long time. If you even round up and consider a human lifespan to be a hundred years, it's 10 generations before it's back again. Yeah, and if we destroy too many communities, you know, we don't know how a lot of these species reproduce or how far they can disperse. So if we destroy a large area, even if 
takes a thousand years to grow once they get there, it might take them a while to get back to that area. Yeah. Scary stuff. The, it seems like we're rushing to stay ahead of the destruction by trying to gain the knowledge as fast as we can. Yep. Cool. So I think that is most of our questions, which is perfect because it's just a few minutes uh, before we're finished. Uh, I think we had a five o'clock my East Coast ending time, so two o'clock your time. So if there aren't any other questions, I will take this opportunity to thank uh, everybody at Marine Conservation Institute, Angela and Lance and Madeline, who's been hiding behind the scenes, and Mike Gravitz for all your help and support putting this together. Uh, it was awesome to have you guys help. We're glad we were able to do this. I want to thank everybody who came today. You guys, we really got a lot of people to join and hear us dork out about <laughs> deep sea stuff, which is what we talk about anyway. So um, hopefully you found it entertaining. Uh, our hope is to highlight some of the interesting work that other staff members are doing and have this be an ongoing thing. So uh, please stay plugged into all our social media channels and keep an eye out for these in the future. Uh, we're really excited to do more of them and uh, for let you, to let you guys meet us all. And please remember to check out the Seamount in your pledge. Uh, you're basically saying, yes, I support the protection of, of the Seamounts and uh, donations over $20 mean you get a cool patch that looks like the image that's on your screen. So, all right, you guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. We appreciate your support. Thank you.